Hello, I've previously posted to YouTube a couple of videos showing my experiences riding Amtrak's long distance trains. Recently I took a trip through Canada on Via Rail's long distance train called the Canadian, which runs between Toronto and Vancouver. This video shows several things I learned and my experiences riding that train. Toronto's Union Station is located just a couple of blocks from the CN Tower. It has a large first-class lounge for sleeper car passengers, much as Amtrak does at its stations. The lounge has large comfortable seats, plenty of room for everybody riding the sleeper, as well as free soft drinks and other beverages while you wait. Boarding the train is a fairly short distance from the first class lounge. I was in the type of sleeper known as a manor car. At one end it has two common restrooms, three berth areas, each seating or sleeping two people, but without walls, so they don't have as much privacy. Then there's a common shower, and six rooms which are configured as two or three passenger rooms and then four single rooms much like a roomette on Amtrak. The sliding door to the roomette is much like on Amtrak with a simple clasp and a security lock. However the door is solid does not have a window in it so you don't get to see out into the aisle and that makes it slightly more claustrophobic in feeling. There are some nice latches to keep them from sliding inadvertently. The seat is wide and comfortable although it, instead of a fabric surface it has a more slippery surface. There's a single outlet and once again you're advised to bring an outlet strip if you have more than one thing plugged in. I'm always charging camera batteries, my GPS, my cell phone, running my scanner. Up above the sink area is a storage area where you can put a backpack or something like that. Then each roomette has its own little utility sink with a surface on top which can be used as a small writing area or just to keep things from falling in. You've got hot and cold water. It's potable water so you can drink it. However, on top of the sink there's also a separate spigot for filling water containers. I found mine to be so highly pressurized it splattered water everywhere. As with everything else in the room, there are security latches on anything that moves. As with the Amtrak trains, you have a large window for each roomette although I don't think it's quite as large as the Amtrak windows, but you can still put your normal automotive GPS on the window using a suction cup, and that really does help make the trip more enjoyable. Having a radio scanner along makes the trip more enjoyable too. You can hear a lot of the chatter between the train crew. Yeah, apparently the uh, dog in the baggage car is loose. When the train is westbound from Toronto, it does an interesting thing. It goes out of the downtown area, west along the lake, and then it reverses and goes back up the track and then curves onto a different track that leaves the downtown area in a northwesterly direction. This is, of course, the direction it needs to go to get through Ontario and westbound through Canada. The overhead storage area doesn't have a lot of room, but it is large enough for a backpack and some other things, and the train attendant also keeps 
a, a plastic bag up there with a couple of towels, washcloths, hand cloths, that type of thing. The rooms are air conditioned and you also have a fan at your disposal. The bed is interesting. Instead of lowering down from the ceiling, it's on a fairly heavy door that uh, flips down from the wall. There's a heavy latch to release it. It's counterbalanced so you don't really feel the weight. And then there's a snap latch at the bottom to keep it from bouncing back up. The bed is already made. The mattress is on it. The sheets are tucked in and ready to go. Pillows are already in place. Very simple and the attendant doesn't have to make up the room for you. One pop of the latch and the counterbalanced bed easily rises back up for storage. You have to make sure that you uh, have the sheets tucked in there properly and when pulling it down there is a safety latch that prevents it from falling on it inadvertently. Another oddity of the beds in the roomettes is that they are not rectangular. They are wider at the head end than at the foot end and this is necessary to give you some area to stand and also to clear the sink. Now here's uh, with my flashlight on it shows this small amount of area next to the bed where you can stand up next to the bed. It's uh, less than a foot wide, but it is adequate to stand up in, and you can access the sink. The toilet which is in each room is covered up by the bed while the bed is down. So unless you want to use the sink, you have to pretty much run down the hall to the bathroom at the far end of the car or raise the bed. As just demonstrated, the room has a nice reading light next to the bed. You've got that fan up there. There's a couple of places to hang clothes from hangers. Once again, the small area where you can dangle your legs over the edge of the bed and stand up if you want to during the night. Uh, once again, the bed covers up the toilet. And there's your little sink area. Stretching out on the bed at night, it's quite comfortable. Uh, but again, the room is probably only six feet long, so if you're tall, you may have to sleep with your knees bent. The room is adequately tall to stand up in. I should note here that pretty much all the way through Canada on the Canadian, I found that the quality of the tracks was subpar. Uh, the worst rails I've seen on any Amtrak route in the U.S. are generally better than pretty much the whole track going out from Toronto to Vancouver. So you get a lot of jouncing around and uh, it's more of a rocking to sleep motion than you would get on Amtrak, uh, which is just generally a bit quieter and smoother. design of these rooms is that the curtain is a semi-rigid pull-down structure instead of just a normal curtain that goes across and it hits the GPS. In the morning when you're ready to get up you just tuck your sheets back in. There's a little area around the edge that you can tuck them into and that makes it fold up a lot nicer. It takes just a few seconds to do it. leave the corner security clasp and the counterweighted bed comes up pretty easily. And the seat just unfolds below it. <clears throat> now I found that the first time I did it I hadn't tucked the sheet in quite enough and it was binding so a quick bit of retucking and then it would close properly.
Ten one SSC France, well over. Ten one over. Yeah, the lady at the station uh, said she she's running into the station to get uh, four or five feet of rope. She's on her way to uh, drop it off to me right now. Over. Okay, that's awesome. Thanks a lot. Uh, <coughs> Just let me know when you're closed up. Okay. They're still trying to figure out how to deal with that one dog back in the baggage car. Hello, Cap. So here's a bit of a tour of the layout of the train. I'm walking forward through the sleeper car past the four roomettes, and then the hallway jogs to the left to clear the full-size rooms. Again, this is almost identical to Amtrak's layouts. At the far end of this hallway is the shower. And then you jog to the right again, and you're into the area mm -hmm. of the berths. Now, since it's still early in the morning, some of the berths are closed with their little curtains, and they're in bunk bed mode at this time, so there's one person sleeping above another in each berth area. And you continue past the two bathrooms and into the vestibule area between the two cars. Unlike Amtrak, these are not sliding doors. You have to open them manually. Now past the roomettes in the next car. Jog to the left. Past the full-size bedrooms. And these hallways, just as with Amtrak, are just wide enough for one person. If you have two people coming in opposite directions, somebody has to back up into a doorway or some other wide area. Now these berths are unused, so they're in daytime configuration instead of bunk bed configuration. Once again, through a vestibule into the next car. And through another set of roomettes. fellow who's decided to back up into the next available wide spot. One more vestibule and this should be the lounge car. There were three sleeper cars sharing a lounge car. In the middle of the lounge car is a staircase up to the elevated dome area which is for exclusive use by the passengers in the sleeper car is associated with that lounge car. I never found all the seats to be full on my four-day trip. Most of the rail route between Toronto and Vancouver is apparently a single track instead of the double track more commonly found in the States. As a result, the Canadian train has to pull over quite frequently onto sidings to allow freight trains to go by. These are very long freight trains stacked with double-decker containers. And I've been told that this is a lot of stuff from uh, ships coming from the China and other areas, and then they put them on trains and take them across the continent rather than take the boats around the uh, south end, especially if they won't fit through the Panama Canal. I found that I spent almost all of my time in the dome above the lounge. You get a nice view, you can see forward, it's fun to watch the train uh, snaking in front of you. You definitely get nice views of the beautiful terrain, especially this first part in Ontario. Just one gorgeous lake after another with pristine woods, forests. On the train that I was on, and I believe this is typical, there are two sets of three sleepers and one lounge car each, and those two sets share a common dining car in between them. The dining car is well-staffed, and the service is excellent. The 
meals were fine. I think much better than those on Amtrak, although I'm not complaining about Amtrak's meals either. And the camaraderie, as with uh, other train travel, is almost always very good. car to the sleeper. In my case I had the sleeper car farthest from the lounge. To keep track of which car you're in, it's important to remember that each of these cars, each of these sleeper cars, has its own name. And they're all given the name of something or another manner. And when you enter a car, the doorway says the name of the car you're leaving and then as you go through the vestibule the doorway into the next car says the name of that car. In addition there's a plaque on the wall uh, just about where I'm ready to turn here in this video you might get a glimpse of it right there on the left that has the name of the car and also the reasoning for that name. It can get quite dark in some parts of the car, especially at night or early in the morning, as the uh, the section with the berths is not illuminated. And this would be my room. I didn't zip up the external curtain. Looks like the car attendant must have done that. Here it's a little awkward to unzip it with one hand and into the room. About once a day the train will pull into a station somewhere for an extended refueling stop. The locomotives get refueled, the crew often changes, although maybe not all of the crew at the same time. Some of the crew stays on for almost the whole uh, trip. Now this particular stop was in uh, Ontario at a town called Hornpain, a very small town and it's an unprepared station, just gravel alongside the tracks, pretty dusty and noisy, but everybody was encouraged to get out and walk the length of the train, stretch their legs, if they're smokers they can get a good long smoke, and uh, while I'm on that point, just as with Amtrak, no smoking of any kind is located, is permitted anywhere on the train, including the vestibules. So the uh, refueling stops are uh, a good place for smokers to get out and take care of that. Here you can see some crew members changing, new engineers for the locomotives. And the stop was about 40 minutes long in this case, so there was ample opportunity to take a leisurely stroll. before when returning to your car from any station stop where you can exit the train you can either look out for your car attendant who you'd recognize by that point or you can pay attention to the name of your sleeper car which is also marked on the outside of the 
car just as it is on the doorways and the plaque inside. My particular car was Elgin Manor, and there it is prominently displayed on the side of the car. Partially due to the length of the ride and also due to the need for frequent stops to let freight trains pass, the trip is a three and a half day extended duration trip. By the end or the middle of the second full day, the train finally passes out of Ontario into Manitoba and the landscape becomes much flatter and really less picturesque. trip we ran into some thunderstorms into uh, the eastern edge of Manitoba. But the dome car is a great place to catch those views. Now we're passing through uh, the area around Esterhazy, Manitoba, where there are some large potash mines. And you can see the tailings piles uh, from quite some distance away. If you're heading west, the train finally passes Brule Lake just on the eastern outskirts, or rather just outside the eastern outskirts of Jasper National Park, and you finally get views of the mountains. This mountain is known as Folding Mountain, and it's right on the border of Jasper National Park, the eastern border. The train track runs through a tunnel which marks the eastern border of Jasper National Park, and right after coming out of the tunnel, the track is then along Jasper Lake which offers several wonderful views of some very prominent and picturesque mountains in the near distance. As you might expect with a national park, there's lots of wildlife. 
my train passed by a grizzly bear just standing there patiently waiting for the train to pass. Very much like a commuter. The front windows of the domes on the lounge cars do accumulate quite a few bugs depending on the season and visibility gets a little poor at least for photography. So uh, by the time you get to Jasper, they finally come out with a cherry picker and uh, do a pretty decent job of cleaning the, the front windows. They don't touch the side windows if my trip was any uh, indication of their normal practice. past Jasper National Park, the westbound train continues through more of the Canadian Rockies. These are very picturesque mountains, although I'm unsure of the elevation. They don't seem as large as the Rockies in the, in the U.S., but still very attractive and nice viewing going through. Okay. We saw one two years yeah. ago. We pulled in and, uh -huh. and uh, saw, saw a brown bear. I think I'm going to say it was probably the same guy. Probably the same guy. Yeah. Do you seem to be slow? Your heart's beating. Makes no sense. We were going to have the traffic controller let us stop and get people off for five minutes. So don't get me mad at me though. It didn't work. The general storm. Yeah. Yeah. So other than that, is there another main stop that stop for an hour or something? Yeah, Kamloops. Kamloops. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, By early afternoon on the third full day heading west, the train is finally into British Columbia and passes Pyramid Falls. trip. Heading west you awaken in western British Columbia approaching Vancouver.
suspension bridge here is the uh, Highway 1 bridge. Along the Fraser River, the tracks finally go over a swing bridge alongside the Highway, highway 1A bridge. And you're into the actual uh, part of the land that the city of Vancouver is located on. Station. Hope you've enjoyed the video and found it useful.